My name is Bill McCann. I'm the president and CEO of the Texas Medical Center, and I have to tell you, I'm really excited just to kick off a couple of brief comments, but more excited about what's taking place here. When we talked about health policy as an institute, which is the first institute that we created in the Texas Medical Center, and this all came from our strategic plan where we laid out a path for the first time in our 73 years at the Medical Center of what could we do here to really leverage this intellectual powerhouse uh, called the Texas Medical Center, probably uh, not properly named. Many people, should, we should, probably should have called it the Texas Medical City because when we connote a medical center, we think of a hospital and a medical center. And it's, as you know, many people that come here for the first time commonly say, I had no idea. But what was exciting to us about health policy is we knew that we had so many scholars and bright individuals that were living this every day, all of the issues that surround us around health care in this country. And this is a great microcosm of many things happening in this in this, the, the world of healthcare in the most diverse city in the United States. And what a petri dish for health policy for us to really tackle and take on a lot of the toughest issues. So um, I was so excited because a lot of times I used to tease uh, Dr. Garson and say, you know, um, do we need to get a large room because will there be a turnout? And we blew out the room in the first time and actually I see that we've kind of moved past this room. So I think we're gonna have to start next year. We're gonna have to take over the entire restaurant to do this. So um, for all of those, I have to get to social media. For all of those that are tweeting, uh, you can use the hashtag uh, healthcare future for tonight's evening. So we'd like to hear your comments. Um, I'm really excited about also the, the work that's been done here that we've had over 1,300 people, both in person and online. I don't know if that counts this evening, um, but a great turnout. And I have to tell you that I know a program's working really well when on a Saturday morning, thinking I'm getting away from the Texas Medical Center, early Saturday morning, I'm about to tee off a golf ball, and a person is telling me, said, I intended a really great health policy class, <laughs> and, and I did it online. And so it, it, it haunts me in a, in a positive sense of the word. Um, special thanks to the course directors, the course leaders, our panelists, which represent over 20 of our institutions, which is something that's pretty exciting. Um, and I also know that for the students in here that are taking this for credit, uh, it represents Texas Women's University. We have University of Texas, uh, University of Houston College of Nursing, uh, University of Houston Clear Lake. Did I miss any? Or is ra anyone raise your hand if you're a student from some other place? If you're online, just tweet to us about it. Um, but I'm really really proud of this team and when we started with a vision you just hope that it's going to meet expectations and on every level the the health policy institute has exceeded all expectations and uh, largely attributed to our uh, number one draft choice out of the university of virginia bringing tim garson back to houston where his heart and soul belongs and started um, and, and Ryan has done a great job, and, and the entire team here of executive directors that contribute to this. We never wanted it to be about TMC. We wanted it to be about this entire community of leaders in, in healthcare and health policy. So I want to thank you. I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dr. Linder. Are you taking it over? Um, but enjoy this evening. I understand that you make them do uh, hard work before you serve uh, drinks or, or hors d'oeuvres. So. Um, enjoy your evening, and uh, thank you for allowing me a few minutes of your time. Thank you, Bill. Thank you all for coming, and welcome to our final session of the 13 in our health policy course. Tonight we're going to look to the future, but we're going to start by looking to the past. So think about the 20th century so long ago. And we're going to have each of our panelists whose bios you have on sheets on your chairs. Um, I'll refer to them by name as opposed to going through those bios. The 20th century was the grounding for much of what we experience today in healthcare and the healthcare system. It started out by some accounts as serving the merchant marine, commerce, was a driver. And of course, 
a lot of the disease control was connected with military action. So you had war and commerce creating the foundation of a system that we're living with today. From the merchant marines, we had progressive reform. And by 1911, the first single payer bill was introduced in the US Congress, and it has since had many lives, uh, none that have been sustained appreciably. But let me start with what it was in the 20th century that we did right, and what it was that we did wrong, and what the implications it has for our current day. We'll spend a short amount of time looking backward, then talk about our current system, current status, again, what's working, what's not working, and then we're gonna spend the disproportionate amount of time, an hour at least, on our scenarios for the future, and then on how we get there from here. So let me begin then by asking our panelists what it is they think we did right and what we did wrong in the 20th century, going back as early or as more recent as they care to go, and we'll start with Dr. Hoft. That was not on my homework assignment. Uh. I mean, <laughs> no, I can do this. I took four grandchildren to Disney World. I can do this. Uh, See, so I, I, I'm the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, from a nursing perspective, I think our contribution to healthcare has, you know, since the 1850s and 60s, been pretty consistent in terms of uh, caring, and with a very broad definition. I think one of the the, the things we've done right um, uh, kind of go hand in hand. Our movement in the 20th century of, of, of moving nursing education from a, an apprenticeship uh, in a hospital to the university collegiate education model has uh, laid the foundation for the development of theoretical models upon which nursing science is based. So one of the major accomplishments I think that we uh, created for the practice of nursing and our contributions to health care was creating models which allowed us to make consistently evidence-based decisions that were um, you know, based on research and, and uh, the scientific uh, uh, method uh, while not losing our caring component. I think that's probably one of the, the things that we've consistently done right is kept caring uh, a prominent and important part of health care in this country. Um, one of the things I think we've done wrong is the, uh, the extensive fragmentation of care based on type of provider and uh, access to health care, which got placed somehow as a benefit to working, uh, as, a, as an employer benefit rather than uh, a right to all. And I think it's led us down the pathway that we're all still dealing with now. It was very much on purpose, though. Oh, we yeah. understand that, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Dr. Ewer, please. Well, as, a, as an attorney, I, I think that what attorneys so often say is, it depends. <laughs> it depends on whose perspective one is looking at of what was right and what was wrong. Uh, managed care was clearly right for some coalitions and clearly wrong for others. Um, we just heard it mentioned that we've gone down paths and it is exceedingly difficult to go away from a particular path and probably impossible to start over. So when we hear about things like employer-based provision of health care, uh, what really was the rationale for that? How it evolved is, is interesting, but the, the bottom line is, is it now rational to continue it? Uh, is it rational to continue research in a haphazard way when we could be getting answers quicker for some of the hugely important clinical and public health questions? Uh, it took us years to ascertain which patients really could benefit from things like coronary artery bypass surgery uh, because people elected to say, oh, this is new, I have to have it, rather than I'll go into a clinical trial. And there are countless examples of where we could have answered questions better 
both from the point of view of individual patients and the point of view of public health. There are a lot of things that we have done that are tremendously important. When we think back to the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Justice Cardozo, uh, in, the, in the famous case of Schollendorf, uh, said it's really not the hospital's responsibility, as long as the hospital picks people that are okay to serve the patients that come in. And over the years, we have realized how important providers are along with physicians, and that has hugely expanded. We have become somewhat tunnel visioned in our approach to patients. And patients with a broad problem list very often find it difficult. So those are the things that really we probably didn't do as well as we should have. There are economic reasons for them. There are cultural reasons for them. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to look at it, and I'll stop there. Dr. Garson, please. Probably better to start with what's right, because that's shorter than what's wrong. <laughs> no. um, I, I think what's right is we've managed to innovate for the world. Now, that's not, a, uh, it's not a paternalistic innovate because goodness knows there are innovation all over the world. There are innovation in, I mean, I remember taking a group to Buenos Aires and thinking we're going to teach them something about cardiology and the guy that invented you know, some of the early coronary uh, cath surgery was you know, right there in, in Argentina. But I think we have innovated as a country and we should be proud of that. If you look around the Texas Medical Center, you see innovation. That's what we do. Uh, so I, I think that's been a real positive. I think it may be that where we have come over the last, let's call it, since the Second World War, which is really when sort of modern health insurance with the employer base uh, came about, I think this may have been a necessary evolution. Uh, I, I can't actually believe that I'm saying this, but some of the mistakes... <laughs> it's some being the, recorded as well. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mom. Some of the mistakes we've made may have been necessary, um, but enough already. Um, it's enough with the mistakes. So, I, But I, I do think as you go back and you look through... The, the ways in which past presidents and past legislatures have tried to, to reckon with this, they've, got, they've come at it in a number of ways, and it may be that ultimately, hopefully, in the next 10 years, uh, we can sort of now do what's right. I, I think I would come up with two things that I think are horribly wrong. One is the uninsured. We have no business, none, having one person uninsured, not... 36 million or 44 million or wherever it comes and goes to this week. Um, so I think this whole concept of having the uninsured and when you then look at that, yes, we are 44th in life expectancy, why? A, a fair amount of that is being uninsured. Uh, some of it isn't. But so I think we've done the uninsured wrong. And I wish, I, I you know, I, I recognize television. Um, I, I wish that, it, that how we manage our system was not so dependent upon the one vote of John McCain. Uh, I, I wish that we somehow were able to create better policy and, and maybe pre you can't get politicians out of this but maybe present better options and, and, and have better dialogue rather than uh, have especially over, uh, and literally that was probably my biggest shock in health policy in, in the last 10 years is we came one vote away from taking health care away from 22 million people. And that was frightening and it still may be frightening. So we gotta figure out some way where that doesn't happen and where maybe um, better ideas are presented to the folks in Washington or Austin. Thank you, Dr. Spann, please. 
Well, as a medical educator, I think that one thing that we did sort of right was to change medical education as a result of the Flexner Report in 1910. Medical education became uh, much more standardized, much more scientific in its approach, um, leading, I think, to more scientific medical practice and ultimately to greater biomedical research in medical schools. Now, that, that also had some unintended consequences, uh, specifically, I think, leading to more medical subspecialization, uh, which was reinforced by the Second World War. And by the uh, 1960s, the, the disappearance of the general practitioner and the, the personal physician, uh, you will, replaced by, uh, by specialists and subspecialists, which led to uh, the Mills and the Willard Report and, and, and a public um, cry for, for strengthening the role of a generalist personal physician, which ultimately re resulted in the establishment of the American Board of Family Practice and residencies in family medicine to try to bring back that role of a generalist, personalized physician. Um, we are still struggling with that, um, and I think that was one of the unintended consequences of Flexner. I think we did a lot of things well in terms of primary prevention, for example, recognizing the, uh, the adverse effects of smoking and, and ultimately getting uh, people to, to stop smoking, a decrease in the, in the uh, prevalence of smoking, recognition of a lot of the risk factors for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and, and better control of those. Um, secondary prevention, the, the development of screening tests for a number of, of cancers. Certainly in the treatment of symptomatic disease, a lot of developments both medically uh, and surgically uh, that probably uh, led to, to our having, in some ways, the be best sick care system in the world. If you're really sick, there's no better place in the world to be than the Texas Medical Center. As Dr. Garson has said, that does not necessarily mean that we have the best health care center. Uh, I think the, the advent of evidence-based medical practice, uh, bringing evidence to what we do in healthcare practice, uh, all the way from critical review of the evidence to systematic uh, reviews of the literature, synthesis of evidence, uh, clinical practice guidelines, uh, very helpful. In terms of healthcare delivery, uh, the, the, the advent of health insurance and HMOs and Medicare, I think, has had some, some positive uh, effects. Uh, a new emphasis toward the end of the century on quality improvement and patient safety, uh, focus on the measurement of processes of care and outcomes of care, although we still struggle to really do a good job measuring outcomes. The application of information technology to clinical care, all the way from electronic medical records to ready access to online uh, medical information, uh, the utilization of the, uh, of the internet, and other modern uh, telecommunication technologies in the area of uh, telehealth, I think, uh, have been very helpful. I think another important uh, change and positive change uh, has been the strengthening of the healthcare team, a team-based approach to care. The advent of nurse practitioners and physician assistants in, in the presence uh, uh, of a, quote, physician shortage and really the strengthening of the, of the healthcare team. We've moved from physician-centric care to more healthcare-centric team, healthcare team-centric care, and now ultimately to patient-centric care. Now, now there have been very positive results of all this. Life expectancy has gone up by about 30 years. The epidemiology of disease has transitioned from acute infectious disease to more chronic degenerative diseases, but the consequence has been a steady rise in the cost of care without parallel measurable increase in quality of care, leading us to a situation of low value care, particularly when compared to other uh, developed countries. 
Fragmented care uh, has been a consequence, I think, of the increased dependence on specialty care. And part of the consequence of that has been the depersonalization of care, loss of relationship, decreased trust, and decreased patient satisfaction with care. Now, I am a primary care physician. I put that bias on the table, but I would point out that there is a plethora of evidence from Barbara Starfield's work at Hopkins that healthcare systems that have robust primary care infrastructure have higher quality and lower cost of care, meaning high value health care. And regretfully, that is not the reality in our own country. Good, thank you. Now, we've had lots of uptake, I can tell, from the audience, and you've heard some really wise views here, some with detailed information, some reflections, and now it's your turn. So I'm, I'm going to take the best and the worst, and I'll, I'll take one hand for each, and Dr. Begley had his hand up for, are you, I would like to hear you say the best of what happened over the 20th century in the development of healthcare. I thought I was going to <laughs> question the panelists <laughs> further See what on I their what hypotheses about yeah. answers to that question. But I, I will, I'll put my question in trying to make it a kind of a claim. The best, going forward, we hear a lot about the healthcare system needing to move towards a more population health valued uh, outcome approach to things. I heard several of you in the panel talking about caring for the individual patient, personalized care. Can we move towards population health, improving outcomes for populations, and at the same time preserve or continue to focus on individual patients? That's a hard one. Um, any takers? I think so. Sure. I absolutely believe that we can. I think that when I am in the consulting room with a patient, my focus is on that patient, but I have to pay attention to the context of the population. The epidemiology of disease, uh, my patient population that has similar characteristics to this patient, for example, if this patient is diabetic, how well am I doing taking care of my population of diabetic patients in terms of controlling their hemoglobin A1Cs and um, all the other parameters that we follow. Uh, so I, I don't think that they are mutually exclusive. And in fact, I believe that we improve the care of the individual when we understand the context and the data of the population. Dr. Garza, did you? Yeah, I, I think they paradoxically may not be related at all in that you're in, you're in an exam room with a patient, in my case, a patient and a family. Um, that relationship is only bolstered by what Steve is talking about. What I'm hoping is we reduce the cost of care tomorrow morning, and by doing that, we get more ability, paradoxically, I hope, where the docs don't have to take eight minutes, they can take 10 minutes, or 18 minutes, or 40 minutes, or whatever is necessary, and thereby actually improving the relationships between patients, physicians, nurses, all sort of caregivers, and at the same time, perhaps taking the population health metrics and, in, in fact, by improving them and getting rid of all the darn waste, maybe saving more time where we can actually be with the patients more, not less. All right, let me get the worst of the 20th century. Anyone want to offer that? The worst of the 20th century, yes. With a question attached, if you'd like. Hi, I'm Dr. Gayata. I work at MD Anderson in the emergency department. I used to work in the ICU, so that kind of gives you a perspective where I'm coming from. While I appreciate everything the panelists have said as far as all the improvements that we've done, 
my concern is that we're not providing that for everybody equal access. Yeah. I work at MD Anderson, you know, we're curing cancer, we're doing a lot of research, but I can tell you, you know, that we don't give that to everybody. We, not everybody has that opportunity to come to MD Anderson. I see that all the time in the ICU and the EC. So I think that's what we've done not well in healthcare. Comments, Dr. Ewer, yeah. well, Dr. Uh, Huff? I think you're right, I would agree with you. And, um, and, and, we, and recognizing that our focus going forward is, is looking more and more in prevention and, the, and understanding what is it that's contributing to those rates of cancer and different kinds of diseases. I think we're gonna to have to focus, uh, in going back to the question about population health and, uh, versus or in combination with personal health, understand, we're gonna to have to be, get a lot smarter about global and environmental conditions that are contributing to the things that we're seeing and how we, and, and think about how we can engage folks in different ways other than seeing them in a hospital or an emergency room that might help them to be more functional, to have different kinds of lives, to be able to care for themselves, to be able to care for their communities, um, how we deal, if everything from, from the migration of germs to the migration of people and what conditions they come to us. So um, that very definition of health is, is a product in there. The basic issue that, that I think that, that surrounds a lot of the challenges we're gonna have going forward is good old fashioned ethics and how we are going to come to terms with what we believe is right and how we're going to establish values that we stand up for as a health and medical care community and that we realize that the germs and the bugs and the diseases we fight are probably gonna be the least of our problems going forward. Uh, and then having the commitment to put the resources behind it. If we want great health care, we have to pay for it. But expensive health care isn't always great health care. Um, so that's where everybody has. It's not, it's not enough for the scientists to come up with some of those answers. It's the whole community of us to say what we value and what we want. And that's how we're going to engage individuals. Uh, having individuals be part of the decision of how we implement, implement what we, our priorities are in population-based care, I think. Dr. Ewer? Well, there's one component in that examining room that nobody's mentioned, and it's really become almost dominant, and that's the computer. <laughs> and go. we have those computers, and <coughs> among the things that I do is I, I hear comments from patients, and the comment is, he or she never looked at me, he was busy with the computer. Putting things down in the computer take away from some level of communication, of intimacy almost, in the doctor-patient relationship. Now, this has been a hugely expensive migration. There are some estimates that in the Texas Medical Center, one may have spent as much as one billion, with a B, dollars, on the incorporation of this type of a communication system. And clearly there are huge benefits, but there is also some unintended consequences of, of all of this that has affected the doctor-patient relationship. So this is, this is one of the, the things. We are looking for ways to make care affordable making care affordable for millions of un- or underinsured patients, all of whom, when push comes to shove, are going to get more care than some of our third-party payers anticipate. They'll come to emergency rooms. They'll find other ways into the system. And this has resulted in us paying fully two-thirds more for health care than we pay for food in this country. Uh, and, and these are things that we have to grapple with and we have to solve them. And we're asking these questions, uh, but the answers are going to evolve and they're probably going to evolve more slowly than rapidly, at least in my opinion. Thank you. I'll take two more questions on the 20th century. Yes, please. Yeah. Kim Bond Evans, uh, CEO of Serenity. 
and I uh, help healthcare organizations uh, move to virtualized models. So when we talk about uh, population health and, and technology, as we see in the headlines, technology can be used for good or evil. <laughs> so that said, let's talk about how technology is ushering in a new way of caring for people. Because today, many healthcare institutions execute a blockbuster video model in a Netflix world. Everybody has to come to a location to get health care. But consumers are now voicing their opinion, and they're not having it. They're not having it. So now technology can virtualize um, care, allow pe patients to be more empowered, be more self-sufficient, um, be more affordable. So I'd like to hear from the panel on how you know, we actually use technology for good to address uh, healthcare disparities and healthcare access. Um, for uh, multiple communities. Oh, yeah. I'll have a volunteer. And, oh, uh, oh, sure. Please. There was an article, uh, if for any of the, you that are old enough, in the AARP uh, <laughs> magazine <laughs> recently. What is about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, not retired, just old. Um, but uh, that was just fascinating, talking about Mercy, Virtual Mercy Hospital in Missouri. I don't know if you're aware of it. It's uh, and, and a physician that went into, uh, with a very negative attitude, went in to assess it. The bottom line is that train has left the station, and we'd all better learn how to deal with it and deal with it well. And what he observed was a very caring, intense, engaged relationship between provider and patients that were involved in, whether it was on the iPad or the computer or going through their TV at home. And when they have certain kind of devices, they don't need to look at the computer when they're talking to the patient. I predict someday they're just going to stick a little pill in the, or a little something under your skin. It'll monitor everything, and they won't, it'll go directly into the computer, and your care provider will just be able to engage with the patient. But these patients were very satisfied with it. I think we have, what, 990 health apps now that are available and uh, on your phone or your iPad or whatever, our real challenge is learning how to, you know, those of us that were educated in the 20th century um, need to get up to the 21st century and how we're going to use this equipment to, to provide care and relationships and, um, and personal um, uh, guidance and, and advocacy for our patients. Uh, the way we do what we do may change. Our goals won't change. And we're going to have the help of really good technology to make that happen. It's going to reduce the need for workforce. And I envision that the nursing shortage will actually go away. Uh, but we're going to be expected to do different things. Our big challenges, I think, are going to be in the area that will involve this gentleman next to me, which are going to have to do with how we secure data, how we uh, deal with privacy, how we give pe people still choices when we have answers for this. But um, I think there's nothing almost nothing that we're doing now that can't be done better with technology, and I'm the troglodyte in, in technology, except that caring, interaction, people relationship part. And if we use it wisely, I think it has the opportunity to improve that and certainly increase accessibility. And let me remind all of you that this course is being streamed. We are using technology, <laughs> and we're advancing the way courses are being done. All right, w one more question about the 20th century, and then we're moving on. Yes. My name is Jacob Klementich. I'm a mental health uh, care um, uh, not provider, but uh, recipient, and at any rate, uh, at the group home that I live at, uh, virtually every resident there smokes, and that just drives me body. <laughs> at any rate, um, uh, see, I was born in the 60s uh, after the Surgeon General's warning, and so um, while uh, one person there was born in 1960, yet he still smokes. What I was wondering was, how in the living hell can uh, um, health care providers let the uh, patient with, uh, uh, like, let's say, a, a mental health problem smoke, yet uh, 
um, you know, provide them with uh, a Band-Aid to cover, cover their uh, scratched knee. Thank you. Um, clearly a, a scourge of the 20th century. Um, smoking, Dr. Ewer. Uh, perhaps m maybe more in a general, a general term. At the beginning of the 20th century, the art of medicine was dominant. It was dominant because we didn't have all kinds of things that we have now. We had much weaker anesthesia. We had no cardiac surgery. Things were very, very different. And doctors, healthcare professionals, had to do a lot of hand-holding. As the 20th century evolved, we became more scientifically oriented. We learned more. We learned about cell biology. We learned about surgical techniques. And the art of medicine somehow or other got the short end of that stick. And what we're doing now mm. is we're trying to determine at what level, if any, the art of medicine should still be alive, or is this now all about blood tests and imaging and coming up with an answer and sending the patient out? And when you ask about mental health, this brought to, to my attention that perhaps in mental health, there is even a more important role for the doctor-patient relationship rather than the procedure. And how we'll address that, I'm not sure, but I think we have to recognize this evolution from the art to the science of medicine. Dr. Garson. Quickly, because I know you want to move on. I, I agree with <clears throat> both of you in, in a sort of a way, and I want to try and tie a bow around this. This whole notion that it's technology versus us, I don't think so. Uh, I do think, and, and I've done a lot of thinking about this in terms of apps, and can you really do the whole patient care thing? No, you can't. And it is. It's perfect to say in, in mental health, we need us. The real question is where do we fit? Uh, I'm fairly certain that the hand-holding, the, the relationship is necessary. I really think it's necessary. I have a funny feeling that nurses may do that better than doctors these days. And I think, and, and, and I think we need to take they maybe. They always have. Well, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, 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 think we, I think rather than saying A is, we both have to be better. Yeah. Because I really do think we're not gonna have the app for compassion yep. in the next 10 years. We may 20 years from now. But, but, and I, I think each several years, I mean, I, I used to deal with sudden death in kids, and they'd say, am I going to have to be on this medicine forever? And I'd say, nope, I'm not smart enough beyond five years. Five years from now, you're going to have to. So five years from now, I don't think we're going to have the app for compassion. But I think we've got to continuously, we people, have got to continuously feature what we do, which is the... I, I, it's the compassion. It's the love of the patient. It's not fighting with IBM Watson, because IBM Watson's going to win at that. Right? <laughs> Dr. Spann. I just want to support that. I don't think that, that science can ever replace the art. And I, and I think sometimes we think it can, but that comes at a cost. The fact is that if we take the time to listen to the patient, to build relationships, then we don't need to order as many diagnostic tests and we probably don't need to order as many therapies because in fact relationship is diagnostic and relationship is healing. So I think we need to be careful and not just assume that science can supplant the art. I don't believe it ever can. So we move ahead to the current situation with the Affordable Care Act in the pieces that are still functioning, <laughs> and the fragmented <laughs> systems of care um, that we've talked about in the prior 12 sessions. We're moving ahead now to consider how the current system permits us to see into the future. 
So what kind of scenarios are most plausible given the way the system is fragmented, given what the ACA does and doesn't do, and what kind of system would you want? And how do we get to the system that you want rather than the one that we predict based on what we already have? I'll start with the panelists, then we'll move to audience engagement. Questions, statements, however you'd like to respond. So be thinking about what you want to say, please. So, um, Dr. Huft, would you like to begin? What was the question again? No. <laughs> um, what do I want? Yes, you, um, you can start I, okay, with I what want... the best case scenario is and then okay. speculate on how we get there and you have three minutes. <laughs> okay, I can do this. I want care for everyone as they need it. But more important than that, I want us to, to I wish we had an environment and a world that demanded less of us so there would be less need for us. Um, and I think it's going to require uh, a commitment to maintain and increase the resources we put into healthcare, but not the same way that we're doing it now. Um, I think uh, the, the movement towards outcomes-based care, uh, paying people for the outcomes they achieve, is so complex that we've got the cart before the horse right now. And we're forcing people into practices that I think are going to have unintended consequences before we get any place good. So what I would want is the science and the art to team up somehow to tell us you know, what those minimum data sets are that really launch us towards healthy outcomes for most people. I want a system where everybody gets what they need, but I want everybody to have the autonomy to choose how they get it. And I know that's completely unreasonable, but you said I could say yes, both. You, you, so, and I you am. did it under three minutes, so we're good. <laughs> Dr. Garson. Oh. <laughs> Three minutes. I'm going to take one minute because it's so sure. important, I think. Maybe you didn't tell me I get three. Do I get two? <laughs> no. Okay, I'll go quick. I, I think when you hear about evidence based medicine, uh, how many of you have ever heard of the CAST trial? C A S T? Like one of you. One person. This is important, and, and, and it's, I think, the basis for evidence based medicine, and, and it helps whenever I think about this, to sort of say, well, what's the problem? Here's the problem. Cardiac arrhythmia suppression trial, CAST, 30 years ago. Everybody knew that extra heartbeats killed you if you'd had a heart attack. Easy, no problem. The more extra heartbeats you had in a 24-hour period, the more likely you were to die. No biggie. So the NIH, the FDA, and 12 other initials get together and say, okay, we're gonna do a trial. We're gonna try four medicines and placebo, and we'll figure out which of the medicines keep people alive better, get rid of the extra heartbeats. Terrific. After eight months, the Data Safety and Monitoring Board stops the trial. They look because one, one limb is absolutely better than the other four. Well, you know where this is going. Placebo, was the limb that was best. The other four drugs were killing people. <laughs> so that's when a bunch of people, and I see a bunch of you going, that's when the whole medical community went, wow, we'd better not just do what we thought we were taught, but get the data. Okay, that's unrelated, but I figured it, it, it's sort of important when you think about evidence. We'll start the clock again. Three okay, minutes. three goals. Three goals. One for the people, okay? Accessible, affordable, adequate health care for everybody. Okay? For the practitioners, usins. Actually, being a patient too, but for the practitioners, pay based on quality and less hassles. <laughs> for the nation, improved cost, quality, and life expectancy. So that's a cheat because I sort of, I, I maybe knew that was coming. <laughs> but I think that, and I'm, I'm sure there's better and worse, but that's sort of uh, some thinking about goals for each of us. My eventual, where, and I guess we will eventually talk about this, is something that I'm calling the single safety net. 
rather than the single payer. The single safety net is like public school. You have an ability for a public system. Everybody has that public system. Everybody pays for that public system. You want to go to private school? Go for it. There are plenty of private insurance companies. That's what I'd like to see. That's what I'd call the single safety net. Maybe 15 years? I, I don't see it in the next two. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Ewer? I think this is, this is interesting. These goals that, that you mention, um, do we need health insurance in this country? We have evolved a system where we mention health insurance all the time. In what I do at the cancer center is deal with insurance companies that say, oh, you're out of network, and that was pre-existing, and this is not right, and that is not. Do we really need health insurance in this country, or do we need health care? And if we need health care, can we in some way reverse the path that we have taken that implies that providing health care without insurance is impossible? Now, when we talk about a basic level, that's going to work really fine until you're sick. <laughs> and after you're sick, the answer is, oh, well, there's that treatment, but it costs half a million dollars, and there's another treatment. Wait a minute, I can go to the emergency room, and they'll have to treat me. I'll get all of those things. And this is not going to stop if we have a baseline elementary school level health insurance. We're going to have those people who say, this is my life, how do I get the best possible care. And the solution is to have a much higher level of care and actually have to have the ability sometimes to say no. And there are countless instances. Uh, we heard before from, from somebody in an intensive care unit. There are countless instances where we provide unending feudal care and the Texas legislature has recently changed our do not resuscitate order so that we can do that better and spend more money doing it. And so all of these things have to fit into place. But the one, the one point that I wanted to, to make, and I'll emphasize it one more time, think about whether we really could get away from the path of saying insurance is the only way to solve these problems. So health Thank equity you. is very important, and I think universal access is absolutely necessary. And I would point out that the evidence shows that other wealthy countries who have universal health insurance have higher value care. So <clears throat> I think it would be hard to argue uh, that it will lower the value of our care. Um, I don't know that we need health insurance, uh, maybe there's some other solution, because, because there's significant administrative cost to our health insurance system. I think we clearly need to move to a different reimbursement model, uh, value-based as opposed to fee-for-service care. Uh, I, of course, believe that we need to strengthen our primary care infrastructure. We must pay more attention to delivering upstream care that really considers the social determinants of health, remember that 80% of the preventable morbidity and mortality in this country relates to social determinants, including uh, unhealthy uh, health behaviors and lifestyles. I think that we have to do a better job integrating care both horizontally and vertically, and this, uh, I think, does require better connectedness of our information systems. I still think that more evidence-based care will be better. 30% of the costs of care in our system are wasted. Uh, and so if we do better evidence-based care, that will reduce, hopefully, uh, the waste. I think that we have the opportunity through uh, better data analytics to develop highly accurate prediction models based on population health data 
that will allow us to individualize the benefits of diagnostic and therapeutic interventions, which again will, will lead to uh, higher value care. And I think we have to find ways to be more effective in modifying unhealthy uh, lifestyles and health behaviors. Uh, I think I'll stop there, but those are some of the things that we could do that would make a big difference. Good, thank you. Now, oh, we do. Yes. Well, let's have it. Uh, hey, we've got a um, we've got a question from the online audience. This is from Dr. Jose Garcia, um, and he's actually hoping um, Dr. Span or some of the other panelists can elaborate on the issue of administrative costs. Uh, he knows that utilization rates in the U.S. aren't particularly high compared to other countries. Uh, so. So how much are the administrative costs and what are the, the best proposals uh, on how to reduce them? And if you're watching online and you want to submit your question, just a reminder, send it to healthpolicycourse at tmc.edu and we'll get your questions out there. Only those watching online, though, we can get. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Here, here, you don't have to email us. <laughs> Dr. Spann. Well, my friend Tim Garson tells me that our administrative costs are double those of other, other health systems in wealthy countries. Um, so I think there are savings that could be had by changing our insurance third party system, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think in addition to that, just our payment systems, we need to look inside our institutions and how decisions are made for whatever we're doing. I, I've come to wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat when I think of the term risk management. Um, when I think, uh, just from a nursing school's point of view, but this carries over into clinical care too. It used to be we'd send students to clinical agencies and they'd want to know, do they have all their immunizations? Do they have their CPR? Yes, we can send them. Everything was great. We now spend inordinate amounts of time, money, and effort to provide the, the, the documentation that doesn't even required by the CDC. Uh, the requirements are not coming from the medical director's office or the nursing director's office. It's coming from, God bless us, risk management <laughs> and, and uh, the fear of litigation. And I know it's a big issue, people, you know. But uh, because of that, it's driving up the cost of education. And there are things similar to that. There are a lot of protocols and policies we have within institutions that are not being driven by best practices based on evidence or even our art of medicine or nursing or our in good intuition or good what I call practice wisdom. It's because we don't want to get sued and if we go ahead and do this, then we're less likely to get sued whether somebody needs it or not. And that, that we've moved from defensive medicine to defensive living. Um, there is no such thing as a risk-free world, and how we balance the, the rights and the, the needs of individuals with the ability to just do work unencumbered and at a, in a reasonable way, I think it's gonna be a real challenge, and I think it's gonna get more complex going forward. I don't think it's gonna go, go down. And I mm -hmm. think that contributes to the cost of what we're doing. You've heard from the panelists a number of values that they articulated for what the future ought to look like some desirable features of what that future would look like. And now I'd like to hear from you on what you think the desirable features would be, either in the form of questions for follow-on to the panelists or your own statements about what that ought to look like. Then finally, we're gonna tackle the issue of how we get there from here in our last segment. So please. Yeah, I've come to the conclusion, as one of you mentioned earlier, there's really three components of healthcare: <clears throat> access, affordability, and quality. And I greatly appreciate the comments about extending the access through the use of uh, nurse practitioners. I have the privilege of serving as the uh, chair of the advisory council for UT School of Nursing. So we've greatly seen that impact. The two things I'd like to ask the, the, the panel to address is in, in thinking of the access, the use of telemedicine, and Dr. Ur, when you reference the a world without insurance, uh, the d aspect of direct primary care, which they, uh, those doctors will accept a subscription model, if you will, uh, to be a part of the system 
and then you access individual components on a much reduced cost. If the panel could address that, please. Who would like Dr. Spann? So I'll, I'll address the direct primary care. I think it is a good model, but it does not solve all the problems because it's, it's, it's not universal access. Um, you know, it is affordable access to primary care, but unless you have uh, a, a high deductible insurance policy for, for specialty care and, and catastrophic care, it, it's very difficult because there is no specialty care and typically no diagnostics covered. So, although I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Band-Aid, it's a, it's a reasonable Band-Aid, I don't think that's where we ultimately want to end up. Uh, I personally think that, that telemedicine, telehealth is a wonderful tool. I think that it does, it can enhance uh, relationship between the healthcare team and the patient. I think it can uh, facilitate access to care. Uh, but again, in the absence of some sort of a universal coverage, uh, I'm not sure how it helps people who don't have any money uh, to, to purchase care. Because in fact, even if you're doing it over a computer monitor, over telehealth, there is still a cost to that care. So it doesn't really remove the cost of care, it just makes it easier. And so in the absence of coverage, I'm not sure that totally solves our access problem. Dr. Garson. So I, I had a surprise this morning. I, uh, I had heard that MedPAC, okay, MedPAC is, or the geniuses in DC that deal with Medicare. <laughs> and I had heard last week that the use of telemedicine was actually down. And I said, wow, that's sort of interesting. And I made this mistake of printing chapter 16 of the MedCat, MedPAC report, all on telemedicine, it's about 100 pages. <laughs> Shouldn't have printed it. <laughs> they make some interesting points that I'll, I'll just say a few things about. Uh, telemedicine is about used in, by about 1% of providers right now. It is not very often used. Now remember, there's a lot of providers out there. But I. I think some of the rules, I think, um, should change, all right? A lot of the work so far in telemedicine is rural. Well, whatever happened to the disabled person three, three miles from here who can't get out of bed, who needs that kind of care? I mean, you've all, if you haven't, you know, try and help a disabled person get out of bed, get into the car, get up the stairs, go to the doctor's office, no. Um, so telemedicine to me is being not well utilized, number one, only rural, stupid, um, but not to patients' homes. Of course it should be in patients' homes. So the private insurers have actually gotten there faster than Medicare and Medicaid, where they do cover some, some do, some don't. But it seems to me that, and. It, this is studyable, this is empirically knowable, and I don't, about really how much contact do you need with a person in person before you get on, and you know, does that relationship build several times on video? I don't know, that's knowable, and I'm not talking about the case of the last biennium with the physicians. I'm really talking about whether it's good for the patient and apparently telepsychiatry is pretty darn good. I, I don't know whether that in telepsychiatry, whether you actually have a, you know, you've actually shaken hands once, I don't know. Um, but it, it feels to me that telemedicine has tremendous promise. If it can be into the patient's home, if it can be anywhere, it doesn't matter whether it's rural or not. And I, I've got some I, I know at the VA, for example, there's a fair number of people who are on a telemedicine program that just don't use it. And so I think sometimes having a person there with you, whether it's a spouse or somebody else, who can help navigate some of, of the issues of telemedicine in the future may be helpful. Good. Another values questions. Yes, please. Um, where's the mic? Can you? I'll right. try and speak loud enough. Uh, I'm not a medical or, or legal professional, and though I've benefited from the services of all of them, uh, my question is, it seems, there are four academics sitting there, that education, both in your professions, and particularly for the public, 
would be a crucial part of what we do going forward. And do any of you have thoughts on how that could be structured? I'm not talking simply about political education to get something done, but the understanding of our treatment and that kind of thing. I can speak to nursing education sure. for sure. Uh, and I think education across, uh, across the, the board, uh, we're going to see dramatic changes going forward in the future. I think there's going to be some challenges to the traditional semester structure, getting a degree that's all laid out. We're going to get more and more what they call badges or incremental just in time or for or the kind of education you need to, to be prepared to do a particular task. I think we're going to see more uh, higher education focusing on specific competencies. And, and more and more, we're hearing talk of competency-based education, which is time variable, which means folks are going to come in, they're going to get tested with reliable and valid instrumentation uh, based on whatever kind of competencies or outcomes we want them to have. And as soon as they can meet them, they move on. They don't necessarily keep waiting for a whole semester to go by. If it takes them longer, they may take longer. How we're going to get paid for it, I don't know, and that's a dean's nightmare. <laughs> but um, uh, I think we're going to see challenges to what those uh, competencies are. Except for medicine that has a legal carve out in terms of their scope of practice, um, uh, four years ago, yeah, four and a half, well, three and a half years ago, I gave testimony for the, to the Federal Trade Commission regarding full scope of practice for nurse practitioners. Great, we were very excited. Behind that whole movement was the fact that there is a real movement in this country to remove the barriers that exist in terms of practice acts for all kinds of healthcare providers, nurses, PT, OT, all kinds of folks, dentists, all kinds of folks, to allow for people to practice to the extent to which they've been prepared. And we're going to start seeing all kinds of folks prepared in different kinds of ways to deliver all different kinds of components of that care and licensed or registered or regulated in some kind of way. There are even challenges to that now. The cha and, the, and the friction between uh, across the country and federal control of healthcare providers versus state control, I think, is going to be another issue we're going to have to deal with, particularly in the area of telehealth and telemedicine. Because that's one, that legislation is one of the things holding us back, people being able to practice across state lines. So with those challenges, I, I predict in the future we're going to have uh, even a wider variety of healthcare providers, and it's going to be based on the measured competency and expertise that the provider brings to the table, and we're going to have a demand for higher levels of education and competency to provide that care, and that's going to drastically change the face of higher education. Thank you. This is a perfect opening for Dr. Spann, who can talk about the future of medical education down the street. Yes. Um, I think we have to change the way we train physicians. Um, I think we, we have to teach them more about how to deliver high-value care. I think we have to teach them more about the importance of social determinants and their effect on uh, health uh, and health care. I think we have to train them better around uh, behavioral health, mental health, and, and how to work with the broader healthcare team to help patients modify those uh, unhealthy behaviors uh, and lifestyles. Um, I also think that we need, we need to produce more primary care physicians. Again, I'm biased about that, and our new medical school at U of H will have that goal because I think we have uh, insufficient uh, numbers of primary health care providers uh, in our country. Uh, apart from medical education, I think there's another important piece of education that needs to take place. I think the American public has unrealistic expectations and beliefs about the value of technology in health care. I think there is an implicit assumption that more technology is better. And yet, John Eisenberg showed many years ago that there is, there is, a, there is a curve in which uh, more technology improves care, quality of care to a point, and then the curve plateaus, and then there's a point at which more actually cause iatrogenic uh, problems. I think this drives a lot of our healthcare costs. Uh, look at the number of MRI machines per population in this country compared to other wealthy uh, developed countries. So I think, I think we somehow 
have to get across to the American public. And, and the we is healthcare professionals because I think we have sold the American public a bill of goods. We somehow have to get across the fact that more technology, more intervention is not necessarily better care. Yeah. Either of you? Go ahead. Um, you know, I think something hasn't been mentioned yet, and maybe it's time to mention it, and that is, is greed playing a role in this? Yes. Is, yeah, yeah. is, yes. is, is greed influence, yes. is greed influencing what subspecialties people go into? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Is greed influencing the cost of drugs? Yes. Yes. Is greed influencing the fact that I cannot turn on the television set in the evening without being marketed to by providers and marketers of drugs? Does anybody feel offended by the fact that my seven-year-old granddaughter comes up to me and says, Grandpa Mike, what's erectile dysfunction? <laughs> When are we going to stop this because this is contributing to health care costs? <laughs> Thank you. Well, we just wanted her to learn it when she was five. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, you don't know. <laughs> <that>. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm, I'm going to pose a question because I was really taken aback in one of our sessions about halfway through the year, uh, and it has to do with education of the public. And um, I asked, because I was sitting in the audience, I asked the moderator if I could ask a question. He said, oh, sure. So I, this was a panel on quality of care. And I said, well, and, and it was just like this. Um, and I said, you know, 5% of people with high deductible health plans actually look at information on quality or cost, 5%. And I said, how do we fix that? What, what, what do we do? So I'm going to ask you how we fix that. But the response, certainly, and it takes a lot to shut me up, the response was, quality data is not for the public. It's just for doctors. <laughs> and I about had a stroke. And, but that was an answer from a very learned person. So I'm glad the ooze from, because I almost did the same. But I, I'm really interested in tossing it back to sure. you, if we might, and say, how do we educate you? What, what public, uh, those of you that are public, how do we educate you better? Tell us. With regards to that, I started my career and I spent several years in financial services. And one of the key takeaways that I learned from years in that industry, which is a heavily regulated industry, and it only gets regulated more and more as the years go by, for, for good reasons, is financial literacy. So during a, a major initiative across financial services firms and the need to educate the population on the basics of saving, financial literacy initiative was a big push across the country, across the world, to educate people on the very basics of saving, of uh, compounding, of a dollar, and so forth. And that, I can say, looking back at the economy from 10 years ago to today, that has helped. Just the sophistication and the education of the population is higher as far as saving. When it comes to healthcare, is there an initiative with healthcare education or a healthcare literacy programs across uh, medical entities to educate and put the accountability on the consumer as well for them to be more educated on healthcare? What to ask, how to manage your healthcare medical profile, and how to improve that so you get a better control of your own healthcare. <laughs> Hi there, uh, Deborah Mansfield here. 
So um, we witnessed in 2001, 2002, the state of Texas trying to understand the difference between universities and biotech, pharma, biologic, and medical device companies, meaning a for-profit. So I think here again, we have the nexus of three different types of organizations. We have government, we have for-profit, and we have nonprofit. And they all have different strategies for how they do business and their goals. And so somehow or other, there needs to be some way that we're looking at what are the intersections between these? Because everybody needs to have a win. And then you have also your consumer, which is the customer. So most of the time with a device company or with a pharma company, the customer is the hospital. It's not the consumer. It's not the patient. In healthcare, your customer is that patient. So we have these different slips between users of healthcare and also those individuals that are the actual customers, those that are providing the insurance, so where is the money? And so I think a little bit of what Libby had mentioned just seconds ago, where the consumer needs to be guided on financial literacy, not just for their bank account, but how to manage their life. We also, I think, have to look at the intersections of these different and disparate organizations to see how we're either connected or not connected. Because again, just like the state of Texas not understanding the difference between business and universities, I, th I think we still have to deal with those issues and dig really, really deep before I think we're gonna approach any solutions in this area. Thank you. Yes. So there are a couple of, there are a couple of realities that make the free market concept and the supply demand equation not work in healthcare. Um, one of those is that uh, many times patients have first dollar coverage. So they say, it's not going to cost me anything. I want it. I can't tell you how many patients I've had come to see me with knee pain and they walk in saying, I'm here for you to order my MRI. <laughs> Never mind that you haven't talked to me or examined me. I've got coverage. It pays for it. I want that. Uh, the, second, the second factor is typically patients don't know the costs. We, we don't tell them that's not accessible. We don't, uh, know. We don't know the costs as providers <laughs> most of the time. So, so it's, it's really challenging for those free market um, sort of forces to work in healthcare. But I agree with you. I think we should closer approximate to, to that. Yeah, there, there's a conflicting <laughs> attitude around wanting consumers who shop on quality, but not wanting them to demand too much <laughs> when they discover what that is. Yeah. Just, so, please. Um, we have two over here. So, to that issue of the incentive and um, uh, how do you direct, uh, how do you lower the cost of care? In the end, what I'm curious is, Healthcare is something like 17, 18% of GDP, right? If we do lower the cost of care in a meaningful way, that's going to be closer to 10% or what have you, that, whatever the number is, but it's going to be less than what it currently is. Um, that's a lot of people in this area who are out of a job. Um, what's the incentive for healthcare? to be the driver of lowering the cost of care? I don't, I don't know if your assumption is correct. Um, lowering the cost of health care won't necessarily lower the amount of money that this nation is spending on health care. If we're talking about individual services, if we go look at the value, there may be different services that are provided within that you know, 17% or whatever it is. It may reach more people if we allocate it differently. If we don't order so many unnecessary MRIs, if we don't order so many expensive medications that may or may not work or have side effects that we then have to treat. So looking at how we change healthcare may provide uh, lower costs for all the pieces in it and allow us to extend more care to folks. Um, I, I'm really not, I, I could be wrong, but I don't see this nation being able to ever, in my foreseeable future, spend less on health care, which uh, 
based on the technology that we're going, whether it's the same kind of technology or not, the demands, the amount of folks coming into this country. And one thing that's really, at least, uh, maybe is quickly changing, but really distinguishes this country, the diversity within this country. Um, ethnic, healthcare, socioeconomic, all those kinds of uh, uh, factors that play into healthcare and healthcare needs. So um, I don't think we have a choice in terms of being accountable to folks. Um, and I think some of this may play back to the education question that you introduced, Tim, which is uh, the desire for new knowledge is very episodic and values and personal meaning driven for individuals. Whether you're teaching six-year-olds in a first grade classroom or adults in a healthcare setting or wherever it is, people tend to learn best those things that are most interesting and most valuable to them. So what's valuable to most people is what do I need to know now? And whatever healthcare provider is interacting with that person needs to be ready and able to answer those questions. And we don't have access to that knowledge to be able to really tell people how much something's going to cost and what choices they have and what the relative benefits are based on the cost. Because some of those costs are not being driven by the cost of the treatment itself, but because that treatment is underwriting these other things in another department, which are free. So, it's really way beyond my little brain capacity, but I think you've hit on something that's very important to consider. We'll get another brain to weigh in. Dr. Garson. Uh, another half brain. <laughs> Are you going to suggest now we have half brain? <laughs> Is that what you really consider? An additional half brain to your one, to your, to your one and a half. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so look back, because we're going to look forward in, in a minute, I guess, but look back over the health care plans so far, go back to Clinton, can't think too much before that, go back to sort of Clinton, go back to then the early Obamacare, now there have been two tries in Trump care. What is a characteristic of every one of them? They've not dealt with cost. Every one of them, okay? Look at them. No they don't deal with cost at all. Why? Because the lobbyists go crazy over the fact that, well, if you reduce the cost of health care, my bacon is going to be smaller. And that's a reality. That, I, I remember, I don't know how many of you ever heard a talk by the most wonderful health economist alive who just died named Uwe Reinhardt. And back in the 2008 um, recession, Uva talked to a bunch of us cardiologists, and he said, you know, you could cut the cost of care in 2008 a bunch by firing all the um, people who do your bills, because there are two billing clerks per doctor. There, that would give you about 1.8 million billing clerks. And he said, please don't, because the economy can't take it. <laughs> And so we are going to have to work out if we, in fact, here's an example, okay? Don Berwick has got to be right. We, we're wasting about a trillion dollars a year. Great paper, JAMA 2012, Berwick. Um, 200 billion of that is in overtreatment. So when Michael asks the question, is this greed? There is some part of greed that goes into overtreatment. But now try and fix it. And, and that, that's going to take some talent to try to figure out how to reduce the, you know, billing clerks can probably be billing clerks somewhere else. Um, the, the question would be, where is the money going to come out of the savings? And so if you reduce the uh, the amount cut the amount of overtreatment in half. It's a hundred billion dollars a year. Who doesn't get a paycheck? And and that's got to be addressed. It unfor I, I sounds like job training to me or something. You can't let that completely stand in the way. But um, it, you know we're going to have to deal with that. Obviously nobody has wanted to in any health care reform bill so far for that reason. I think. Please. I'd like you to talk about the market dynamics that are in play because cost is becoming an issue with 
CVS buying Edna, mm -hmm. Walmart about to buy Humana, Amazon, JP Morgan, and Berkshire teaming up to address costs, an emerging consumer community that is rejecting uh, insurance outright and said, I'm going to take my chances and negotiate directly with doctors and hospitals. So also, you can do comparison shopping on Yelp with hospitals and providers. The market is speaking. How do you guys think this, is, and ladies, are, how is this influencing costs? Because cost is emerging uh, as an issue, and people are demanding, companies, consumers are demanding transparency so they can make right decisions. We're down to 10 minutes, so Dr. Ewer. Um, if we look at other geographic locations, uh, we see that we started down this path uh, as a result of what happened in Germany in the late uh, 19th century. And they incorporated employment-based insurance, and it became a model. It became a model for most of Western Europe. And it became a model for much of what happened here, with the exceptions, of course, being the, the VA uh, and the Indian Health Service. The British eliminated most of the problems that we have been talking about, especially the idea of competition and greed and other things, by simply monopolizing health care and making that a national health service where the physicians are employed by the state, the nurses are employed, the pharmacies are employed. We haven't gone down that path, but I, I ask you, in spite of the fact that the Germans did it and did it very effectively, did they get it wrong but maybe do it right? Did the British get it right but because of the war maybe did it wrong, and we have to be darn sure and careful that we don't put the worst of those systems together <laughs> in the future of healthcare in this country. For the final issue, I'd like to take it to the idea about how we get to where we've talked about as a future from here. Now, government's the largest payor for healthcare. Government drives a lot of the reforms that we see. Government funds the science that makes the system innovate. How do, we can't do this without government. So let's think in terms of how we get government to move. And I'm happy to have suggestions from the audience first. Then we'll go to the panel and ask them for their concluding statements. Hey, uh, Michael Baggett, uh, medical student at McGovern. Um, I, not necessarily about government, but necessarily more about physician buy-in. Um, I know you, you know, I heard it quite a bit about social determinants of health and getting our future, training our future medical professionals to care about these issues that we're talking about. Um, but I know that a lot of my fellow students feel already overburdened by how much we have to learn already. So how do you, <laughs> how do you plan on trying to encourage people who, we, we have these resources available. We, we are already given these opportunities to learn about social determinants of health, and we have these exercises. And I remember one of my classmates came up to me afterwards and she says, well, I, I, I can't do this. I don't, have, I, don't, I don't have room in my brain for this right now. Um, and so it, you know, it's, not the fact, it's not the lack of ability to learn or the desire, but the inability to, to just manage all of it. So how do you do that? Um, Transfer to his medical school. Change, change, the, <laughs> change the USMLE. Um, change the USMLE. Uh, most of the knowledge that you have to memorize uh, is, is very available, you know, on the inter internet. And I think we need to teach more concepts, more how to apply those concepts, more how to be a lifelong learner and look up information, and less memorization, uh, probably less of the core biomedical sciences. Um, so I think, I think that's, that's one way. Nice. Eric, that would help you, because you've got a problem tomorrow morning. Yeah. I get it, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, you really do. But for the rest of us, I, I mean, you know, I've been the dean of two medical schools, and I can tell you, the amount of research that goes in on how to teach what is non-existent. 
And I, I, I think Dr. Spann is going to set some of that right. But the whole medical education, what gets taught, how it gets taught, what you need to know. Um, uh, I'll be real interested when you finish with your fourth year just how much of the Krebs cycle you remember. Um, you ain't. Um, and so I think we've really got to, uh, and that's what the USML, right? US Medical Licensing Exam. Um, that's more than you're going to get to tomorrow morning, but we need to do the same thing with nursing schools. We need to do the same thing with medical schools, and that's really sort of erase the whiteboard and say, what do these people need to know? Right. Trust me, social determinants is one of them. Biochemistry, maybe a little bit less. Since this is the last health policy class in our sequence, I'm going to say the word that's not been mentioned tonight, and that's politics. And there's something about yes. politics that needs to change to get government behind the changes that we've envisioned here. Okay. Now, we've got one minute for each of the panelists for concluding remarks. Okay. I apologize to you all. Okay. Please. Okay. For the past four years, I've been the chair of the Governmental Affairs Committee for the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. And I have come to several conclusions. Going to the Hill doesn't make a whole lot of difference. <laughs> Uh, but I go anyway. They don't hear what I always have to say, but the the words somehow. I think that being what we what I'd like to the takeaway to be is being right's not enough. Being passionate is not enough. What we've got to do is take everything we know and uh, and figure out some kind of model for prioritizing that. And we have got to work together. It's not as effective for the nursing group to go to le the legislature in Washington or or Austin, but, and then the physicians go, and then the PTs go, and oh my God, the anesthesiologists, they have got a crew of their own. <laughs> they are passionate. Uh, so, you know, so we're all taking, and that pulls them a different direction. So how's the legislator supposed to make a decision? Okay, who donates the most? Money talks. If we do it together, we can do it stronger. But we've got to have a united message. We've got to have a model for prioritizing what kind of knowledge and evidence and goals we have can get translated into policy that we're going to live with. And one last uh, observation, the context within which uh, uh, our ideas and our needs get translated into policy briefs and then into policy and, and law and then back in terms of how we're going to implement it, that whole context is moving faster and faster. And we academics are slow, and so are practitioners in healthcare. So we've got to figure out a way for uh, you new students, graduates, everybody here, all the folks on the panel, to be able to reach conclusions faster, to, to come together to have a united, clear statement, and to have a system for what's the most important, because those folks can only do one thing at a time, regardless what they tell you. Thank you. Michael? OK, on my wish list would be the following. First, allow lobbying in health care from 3.30 to 4.30 on Friday afternoons. <laughs> Second, mandate that the Food and Drug Administration take cost into account when they balance risks and benefits. Cost is a risk. Number three, minimize the administrative costs. When insurance companies say they are limiting administrative costs, that is true. But the secondary administrative costs that result in thousands and tens of thousands of people being on hold for an interminable amount of time waiting for somebody to give an authorization is insane. So those are the three things that, that I would list. And I could go on, but I'm limited to one, one minute. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Dr. Carson. I'll give you 30 seconds back. We've got to, we've got to reduce the price of health care, period. Not we've got to reduce the increase. We've got to reduce the price of health care. Pretty simple, not, OK? We can get to single safety net and stuff like that, not tomorrow morning. So I think from the standpoint of what we all ought to be thinking about and what the legislators ought to be thinking about, the only way we're ever going to get to coverage of more and more people is if we cut the price of health care so people can afford to buy it. Dr. Spann? The problem is we have this giant medical industrial complex, as described by Arnold <laughs> Relman, who was a former uh, editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. 
And that giant medical industrial complex has a strong and wealthy lobby. Uh, so I agree. I would, I, would, I would not even let them lobby on Friday afternoons. <coughs> uh, I, think, I think they should not lobby at all. And then if we, could, if we could get the political contributions and lobby out of the way, uh, then it would just be a matter of, of the people, the population, voting for what they want uh, and what's right. Thank you. On that note, thanks to the panelists joining me in thanking them. Thanks to all of you for sticking with us for 13 weeks, to all the regulars I see out there, to the enrolled students, to Adele Simon, to Ryan Hollowell, to our AV crew back there. Thanks very much. This has been a terrific experience.